I feel I deserve all the criticism and negativity in the world, but I need to get this off my chest. My boyfriend and I met in college, and we've been together for over six years now, mostly in a long-distance relationship due to living in different countries. We've managed to maintain effective communication despite the distance. This year, I'm planning to move in with him. We've been eagerly anticipating this for years. Here's where I messed up. I have several guy friends, and I often hang out with them one-on-one. -on -one. I always inform my boyfriend about these hangouts, and he's never had an issue because he trusts me. Nothing ever inappropriate happened until one night when I got drunk with a guy friend whom I've always found attractive. I never intended for anything to happen between us because we're both committed to our respective partners. However, that night, he confessed his feelings for me, and I was taken aback and flattered. I admitted to having feelings for him too, and he dared me to kiss him. I succumbed to curiosity, and things turned physical. This continued for three months. I attempted to end it multiple times, but I was weak and kept going back to him. Eventually, I distanced myself, but he persisted in staying in touch even after I tried to break it off. It took me a month to realize how wrong it was, and I finally cut off all contact with him by blocking him everywhere. Now, as you can imagine, I'm grappling with overwhelming guilt, which I fully deserve. Prior to this affair, I was someone who strongly condemned cheating. I had never cheated on my partner, and I held contempt for those who did. And now, I find myself among those people whom I genuinely detest. I'm disgusted with myself beyond words. I feel like a complete failure, and I know I've acted despicably. For months, I agonized over whether to tell him. Revealing the truth would shatter his heart and destroy the future we've built together over the years. Yet, keeping silent felt cruel and immoral, and the guilt consumed me to the point where I think I may be sinking into depression, judging by the symptoms I've read about. I spend endless hours on Reddit reading about other people's affair stories, searching for. I don't even know what. I've lost weight, I can barely sleep or eat, and my mind is consumed by this relentless guilt. I'm barely functioning. A few days ago, I reached a breaking point and called him to confess, as we live in different countries. Reddit, I shattered him. I broke the man I love more than anything, the one I was supposed to spend my life with. His cries were gut-wrenching, and I can't forget how I crushed his heart. He's normally outgoing but keeps his personal life private, and he hasn't told anyone yet. I kept apologizing, though I know I don't deserve forgiveness or another chance. I've come to terms with the fact that we'll eventually have to move on with other people. What I did was unforgivable, and I can't ask him to stay. I'm a complete idiot, and I've created a disaster. I sacrificed the person I love most and our carefully planned future for a fleeting thrill. Writing this doesn't make it any better. Please, don't cheat if you want to avoid ruining your partner's life and your own. Story 2 for the first time in my nearly 25-year career in radio, listeners were hearing a tape program instead of the live broadcast. Inherited from my father, who still owned the station, the morning show I hosted made me somewhat of a local celebrity. Despite high ratings and strong advertiser demand, like most local radio personalities, I didn't earn much. Nonetheless, I loved what I did, much like my now-retired father. Money seemed to be a factor driving my wife's affair. She made a fuss over Derek Prescott's promotion to vice president at Ambrose National Bank. He was being groomed by his father, George Prescott, to eventually take over as president. Kristen, my wife, worked as a loan officer at the bank. Initially, she praised Derek excessively, but her enthusiasm waned. Her interest in me, our daughter, and our sex life diminished. When I tried to figure out when they might meet, I noticed a gap between our daughter catching the school bus and my wife leaving for work. Since I was usually at the radio station preparing for my 6 a.m. show, if she ever questioned my whereabouts, she could simply switch on the radio, hence the tape program. Returning home, I noticed a gray BMW in the driveway, unfamiliar to both me and my wife. Entering cautiously, I made my way upstairs. The sounds confirmed my suspicions. My wife and Derek were engaged in sexual activity on our bed. I discreetly recorded several minutes of video before confronting them. I interrupted them and confronted Derek, but he reacted aggressively, overpowering me due to his size and strength. As he assaulted me, my wife intervened, urging Derek to stop. 
Standing naked over me, Kristen confessed to her affair with Derek and warned me against taking action. She threatened to leave me, restrict my access to our daughter, jeopardize my job, tarnish my reputation, drain our bank accounts, and even arrange for physical harm if I tried to intervene. Defeated, I left the room with my ego shattered. The phrase, nothing you can do about it, echoed in my mind, but I refused to accept defeat. Seeking guidance from my father, I learned about the complaints regarding the lack of phone calls during our program. He encouraged me to fight back, igniting a fire within me. Determined to take action, I spent the rest of the day devising a plan. Upon arriving home, I completed my chores and packed some clothes, leaving enough items and toiletries to avoid raising suspicion about my planned departure. Kristen returned from work, Chelsea was home from school, and I spent time with her. Dinner was prepared in advance, as part of our agreement for Kristen handling Chelsea's morning routine. Later that evening, Chelsea and I reviewed her homework, and in a private moment away from her mother, I shared my plan with her. Chelsea, having already suspected her mother's infidelity, had prepared for the possibility of divorce and expressed her desire to live with me. My plan was progressing smoothly. After Chelsea went to bed, Kristen confronted me. Don't stir up trouble, Dave. Derek provides me with two things you can't, money and physical satisfaction. Once he divorces his wife, I'll divorce you, and he and I will marry. You need to accept this reality and make the best of it. You can see Chelsea whenever you want, as long as you cooperate. Otherwise, you'll lose her. Don't doubt that I'll follow through. The next morning, I began my radio show as usual. However, after 7.30, when I presumed Derek and Kristen were together, I addressed my listeners regarding my wife's assertion that I was powerless to act. This morning, dear listeners, I need your assistance. My wife Kristen and her lover, Derek Prescott, are currently engaging in an affair at my home. I wouldn't make such an accusation without evidence, which you can find on our station's website. Derek holds a position of authority at Ambrose National Bank, where our joint funds are held, or rather, where my funds used to be. Kristen has emptied our accounts to prevent me from accessing our money. When confronted, Kristen informed me that due to Derek's influence and her advantage in a divorce, I'm helpless. For the most part, she's right if I act alone. This is where you come in. If you have accounts at the bank, consider withdrawing your funds. If enough of you do so, I believe George Prescott, Derek's father and bank president, will take action once he learns of his son's affair. I cannot rely on this currently, but a substantial withdrawal may get his attention. In a few moments, I'll be leaving Ambrose. It has been an honor to wake you up for so many years. God bless. Before taking action, I consulted my father, who believed that Derek and Kristen hadn't anticipated me challenging their actions. We debated approaching Derek's father directly, but ultimately chose the broadcast. After signing off, my father took over, eager to return to the microphone. Wishing me luck, he encouraged me as I departed. As planned, I picked up Chelsea from school and retrieved our bags from my car, ensuring I left enough belongings behind to avoid raising Kristen's suspicions. I had withdrawn my personal savings from a vacation fund and savings bonds left to me by my grandmother, whom I believed would consider this situation an emergency. We embarked on our journey in my car, and I asked Chelsea if there was anywhere specific she wanted to go. She mentioned Costa Rica, recalling her fond memories from a mission trip she had taken there. While her Spanish skills surpassed mine, we both had our passports, and I made a mental note to purchase round-trip tickets to save on costs and comply with Costa Rica's immigration requirements. With a 90-day window ahead of us, we had time to explore and decide our next steps. Initially, we indulged in tourist activities that Chelsea had only briefly experienced during her mission trip. We savored diverse cuisines at various restaurants and spent leisure time on our computers and tablets. The lack of communication with anyone back home weighed heavily on Chelsea, prompting her longing for familiar comforts and connections. As the 90-day mark approached, I reached out to my dad for updates. Davy, how's everything going with you and my granddaughter? He inquired. Great, Dad, but Chelsea's ready to return. She misses her friends and being spoiled by her grandparents. Fill me in on what I've missed, I replied. Well, son, you missed quite a bit of drama. 
Apparently, Derek misled his father about the incident you witnessed between him and your wife. He convinced his father that you had exaggerated the situation. George took swift action, closing the bank to halt the deposit withdrawals and filing a slander lawsuit against you and the radio station. As the station owner, I received the lawsuit, Dad explained. Dad, I anticipated this. I filed a countersuit, citing our solid evidence of the truth. I suggested George reach out to avoid further embarrassment and financial losses. He agreed to meet with me and our lawyers, I recounted. We sat down with George and Derek, who was visibly nervous. George demanded to see the supposed ironclad evidence. I asked if he had viewed the video, I continued. He admitted he hadn't seen it, claiming it had been removed from the website due to its explicit content. Derek argued that it was likely a fabricated video, I elaborated. I insisted George watch it, and we showed him the footage until he requested to stop. I then presented him with a certificate from a reputable photo analysis firm confirming the video's authenticity, I added. Let's pause for a moment. Subscribe to the channel and write your opinion in the comments. Let's continue the story. George turned to Derek, giving him one chance to tell the truth about the situation. Derek confessed that he was blackmailed into the affair after a drunken encounter, prompting Kristen to burst into the room and refute his claim, I recounted. She accused Derek of seducing her with promises of financial stability, highlighting their mutual culpability. It was a revealing moment, I concluded. Dad, you're not going to believe her, are you? Derek protested, his face flushed with anger. George's expression was livid as he responded, Yes, son, I am. Effective immediately, you're fired. Furthermore, I'll cover all of your wife's legal expenses if she decides to divorce you or pursue legal action against your lover. Kristen, you're fired as well. I'll ensure your husband's legal fees are covered if he chooses to divorce you. David, is there anything else you and Dave would like to address? I requested a full-page apology ad in the local newspaper, acknowledging fault on behalf of your son and Dave's wife. Additionally, you can purchase advertising slots on our radio station to convey the same message. And what about compensation? George inquired. Dave has incurred financial losses over the past few months, although the exact amount is uncertain. I'll relay your offer to him, I replied. Let him know I'm willing to provide what he deems fair, within reason, George affirmed. I'll convey that message, I confirmed. And David, I appreciate you preventing me from further embarrassment. On behalf of my family, I sincerely apologize for the harm caused by my son. Best of luck to you, George concluded. With only my lawyer, Kristen, and me remaining in the room, Kristen timidly asked, Mr. Longstreet, do you know what Dave wants from me? I'd like to speak with him, at least to offer my apologies. I'm not sure, but based on what he shared with me regarding your comments after Derek's altercation with him, I suggest you start looking for alternative living arrangements, I informed her. I suspected as much. Is there any chance I can see my daughter? I've missed her terribly, and I hope she hasn't been too affected by this situation, Kristen inquired. Dave had Kristen served with legal papers at her parents' residence, where she was staying temporarily. They had reluctantly agreed to her stay until visitation rights for Chelsea's grandparents were determined. The documents allowed Kristen to retain the funds she had already withdrawn in exchange for forfeiting her share of the house's equity. The primary focus was granting Dave full custody of their daughter with liberal visitation rights for Kristen. She didn't even seek legal counsel before proposing this arrangement. We'll proceed with signing the papers after I've had the opportunity to explain and apologize, Kristen proposed during a meeting at Dave's attorney's office. Expressing gratitude for the meeting, Kristen remarked on Dave's improved appearance since his time in Costa Rica. I have an uphill battle, Dave. I'm asking for your forgiveness for my unforgivable actions toward you and our marriage. I was selfish, greedy, and arrogant. My misguided belief in a luxurious future with a new husband led me to utter those hurtful words about your inability to act. You proved me wrong, and I must admit, I'm impressed by your courage in standing up to me and Derek. I had wrongly underestimated you. Regrettably, I'm undergoing counseling as part of my severance agreement with Mr. Prescott, which is proving enlightening yet challenging. 
I'm discovering aspects of myself I never wanted to confront. Dave, you may find it strange, but I was oddly proud of your resilience against Derek and me. You displayed courage when it mattered most. Unfortunately, I failed to exhibit the qualities I would have admired in a wife. I'm grateful for the chance to spend time with Chelsea. We've spoken, and I realize I have a lot of making up to do with her. I hope she'll still want me in her life when she's older. As for my future, I see myself mostly regretting ruining the best marriage I could have hoped for. I genuinely believe I've changed enough to be the woman you originally married. It's a shame I didn't make those changes before ruining our lives. You deserve a better wife than I became. I'll cherish any opportunities to be around you because of Chelsea and our future grandchildren. But I'll say this only once, if you ever reconsider giving me a second chance, I'll do anything just to be near you again, whether we're married or not. My offer stands indefinitely. I'll move on. I don't plan on dating, but that might change after being lonely for so long. I might engage with other men physically, but I'll never love another man like I love you. I love you. With those words, she signed the divorce papers and left. Despite her betrayal and disrespect, I still loved her. Her offer stirred some arousal, but she was like an attractive snake, tempting but dangerous. The urge to forgive her was brief. I couldn't shake the memory of her standing over me, dictating the terms of our marriage and my cuckoldry. Kristen found a new job in the neighboring town and gradually rebuilt her relationship with Chelsea. It took over six months for Chelsea to believe her mom had changed for the better. Kristen joined us for Thanksgiving and Christmas, along with her parents who adored Chelsea. That continued until I started dating someone seriously, thanks to Chelsea's encouragement. When Chelsea found her partner in her junior year of college, she disclosed her mom's betrayal and her skepticism toward extramarital affairs. Their engagement was long, but they eventually married after graduating and securing jobs. Through this process, I met her fiancé's mother, Valerie, a widow around my age. Our relationship developed gradually, not fueled by immediate passion, but mutual affection. Neither Valerie nor I mentioned marriage, but it made sense practically and financially to move in together. Our lovemaking was satisfying, if not electrifying. We were content as a couple without feeling the need to label our relationship further. Kristen remained single, while Chelsea explored casual relationships. She'd been proposed to, but chose not to risk marriage again, still unsure of her own trustworthiness. She embraced grandmotherhood eagerly, and we spent a lot of time together in that role. Occasionally, I caught Kristen looking regretful, as if realizing what she had lost. She'd wipe away a tear, resuming her role as Nana. I stayed at WAMB until retirement, eventually inheriting and selling the station upon retiring. Valerie and I moved to Costa Rica, where our modest retirement funds allowed us a comfortable life. Chelsea considered joining us as the chaos in the U.S. intensified. We assured her of our support if she ever decided to make the move. Looking back on my life, I'm grateful for one thing above all. I took action to change it. Story 3 I met my girlfriend back in 2017, and we decided to move in together the following year. Towards the end of 2018, she expressed doubts about our compatibility, but we continued spending time together. Despite her reservations, I relocated to another state to be closer to her family. On her birthday in January 2019, I noticed a suspicious name on her phone, but she avoided showing it to me. When I confronted her brother, he mentioned her boss as a potential connection, noting their peculiar relationship at work. One night, when she claimed to be at her mom's place and couldn't come over, I discovered her car parked outside her boss's house. Confronting her led to her confession of cheating, maintaining relationships with both her boss and me. Despite this betrayal, fueled by love and perhaps naivety, I spent nearly a year trying to salvage our relationship. During this time, she traveled to Arizona to meet someone she met online, expressing a desire to live there, all while still engaging with her boss. After a period of no contact, she apologized, claiming it was an immature mistake and pledging to end all extramarital affairs. Reluctantly, I took her back, and we moved to a new apartment. However, the infidelity resurfaced in late 2019, involving her boss once again. Feeling utterly broken, I forgave her and navigated the challenges of the COVID lockdown together. 
We eventually moved into a house where we resided until recently. Last Thursday, she informed me that she no longer saw a future with me and cited compatibility issues. This blindsided me, especially after her recent expressions of commitment. Despite my efforts to salvage the relationship, she confessed to cheating with a co-worker from her new job and decided to leave me for him. Devastated, I've chosen not to send angry texts or plead for a return this time. Instead, I've decided to leave the state. Fortunately, my job allows remote work, so I'll be tying up loose ends over the next few months before relocating. She left behind our pets, belongings, and a trail of heartbreak. It's a painful reminder of how love, trust, and hope can be shattered by deceit and betrayal. Thanks for watching.